Session. My name is Otto Balikian and I chair the uh, uh, HBU's New England District. So uh, a little about today's presentation and, and the, the uh, reason behind it. So tomorrow, December 9th, uh, is a day that's been established by the UN as International Genocide Recognition Day. The actual full name is uh, the International Day of Commemoration and Dignity uh, of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and of the pre uh, Prevention of this Crime. That's the official name of the day for tomorrow. And it was adopted in 2015 uh, by the UN um, uh, on the date, December 9th, which is the same date in 1948 that uh, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide uh, was, uh, uh, was adopted. So HBU throughout the world, as you know, has chapters, and, and chapters throughout the world are doing an event, a discussion like we're having here, um, on the issue of uh, genocide and uh, uh, commemoration. So the HBU uh, internationally came up with some topics of discussion, which is what the panelists will, uh, will talk about uh, uh, tonight. And, uh, and of course, we've got the incomparable Mark Mamagonian from Nasser, who's going to be our moderator, and our wonderful panelists, who I will let you uh, introduce. I want to thank you all very much for, uh, for coming and attending, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be very insightful and great evening. So Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, Ara. Um, so indeed, uh, as, uh, as Ara said, this program tonight is um, an, an outgrowth of the AGBU's initiative. And the, the topic tonight is incitement to genocide, freedom of expression, and social media. Now, we all know that uh, genocides that, that, uh, that have occurred throughout history, uh, certainly in modern history, uh, begin, or, or at least in, in part, begin in the speech uh, directed against the victim groups, whether it's the Armenian Genocide, the Holocaust, uh, Rwanda, Darfur, down to the present day. Uh, speech begins the process uh, that becomes enacted in the form of physical violence. We also know uh, that throughout history, uh, or at, at the very least since um, Gutenberg's revolution uh, of, of, print, of print, there's been a debate and a discussion on how the dissemination of information uh, should be limited or, or governed. And uh, whether it's print, uh, or whether it is radio, television, film, or any other media uh, for the mass uh, dissemination of, of information, there are risks and there are limits that have been placed uh, on, on that dissemination. Today, in the midst of uh, the, the revolution wrought by the internet, and social media, we find ourselves at another place in history uh, where many of the same debates are taking place, but perhaps on a different scale, because the internet and social media has elevated everything to a instantaneous global scale. And also because the uh, traditional so-called gatekeepers, uh, who perhaps kept the reins on some of the media in the past seem to have disappeared. Now, we're not going to have a conversation today generally about social media and what people do or do not say on social media and what they can or cannot say. The focus is specifically on the incitement to genocide, freedom of expression, and social media. And we have three outstanding speakers to address aspects uh, of these subjects. Now, I just wanted to read briefly uh, the, the agenda that was laid out by the AGBU uh, to structure tonight's discussion, in which each of the three speakers, in their own way, will address. One, 
is the international system able to control hate speech and, and incitement to genocide? Are truly, are our current structures able to match technological advancement used by inciters? Two, corporate responsibility and incitement to hatred and genocide. Can a balance still be struck between freedoms, free flow of information, and prohibition of incitement to hate and genocide? Freedom of speech versus hate speech. Lessons learned from Myanmar, Rwanda, Iraq, and Turkey, and perhaps other instances. And between freedom of expression and prohibition uh, of incitement to hatred and genocide on social media, are we in need of a new due diligence policy, a new approach? Is the world missing something on this subject? So I want to introduce our three speakers. I'm going to introduce them each now briefly, and then they can come up without me getting up to interrupt. Our first speaker is Dr. Henry Terrio, who is the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at Worcester State University. And he is a, a founding co-editor of the journal Genocide Studies International. And he serves as the president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. And he is truly a, a, an expert on all matters related to genocide and the rhetoric of genocide and genocide denial. Dr. Ohan S. Kilichdaga uh, completed his postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at Harvard University, and he currently serves as the coordinator of the Krikor Gergerian Online Archive Project at the Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. And next semester, he will be teaching at Columbia University. Dr. Jermaine McAlpin is Assistant Professor and Chair of African and African American Studies at New Jersey City University. He is an internationally recognized expert and consultant on transitional justice, genocide, and reparations, and his research interests include truth commissions, commissions of inquiry and political accountability, reparations for historic injustice such as slavery, Native American, and Armenian genocides. So please. Welcome our first speaker, Dr. Henry Terrio. All right, we'll get the, the bad stuff out of the way first and you get more interesting speakers as we go. Um, all right, I'm going to start off actually by saying two things. One is to quote Stanley Fish, who's a very famous uh, uh, literature professor and, and so forth. There ain't no such thing as free speech. We've got to get that out of the way. No one speaks in an unconstrained way. There are legal uh, impediments to speech all over the place. There are things you absolutely couldn't say right now, right here. Um, and similarly, there are very powerful social limitations on what it's possible to say. Those are actually, according to John Stuart Mill, the 19th century uh, British philosopher, the social prohibitions on speech are actually much more powerful than the legal prohibitions. In fact, he was writing in the 19th century where England had a great deal of freedom of speech in legal terms, but was struggling with the kinds of social pressure. He's getting into the sort of Victorian era, the social pressure against really expressing differences of, of views that, that ran against um, the norms on religious grounds, sexuality, and other kinds of things. Um, and he saw a direct connection to that, to limitations on lifestyles around issues that should be individual choices. Um, so that's the first thing we got to know. Um, and then I would say another part of the lack of free speech is related to the technology issue. And that is the fact that I think the more freedom we have, the less we use it. Um, if you look at how people communicate in common everyday environments, um, I really see, and I get to see, you know, college students all the time, for instance, as well as through my kids, everything from zero to, to 18 before them. And what we really see is if you listen to how people communicate, um, pretty, people are saying, using the same kinds of phrases, the same kinds of things. You'll be amazed if you saw something on TV, um, a certain way of speaking, that just catches on and everybody uses it. If you look at social media texting, everybody uses the same codes, the same kinds of terminology and so forth, right? We somehow naturally restrict ourselves and we try to break out of that use of language. Um, you can pay a price. Um, you look strange, you look weird. One of the challenges with English as a second language um, issues in the US is in fact that oftentimes people who come to English, a lot of Armenians in the audience who may have had this experience, 
use English in a more innovative way than native speakers do. I'm a native speaker of English, and I am bound by years of bad education teaching me how not, you know, how to use English in this really restricted way. And no cracks with Mark, because he knows the hometown. We had rival hometowns, and my hometown is kind of worse, um, and the school system was worse. So he'll he'll joke about my education. Um, but we we really sort of um, constrain ourselves, and and so. Um, there are so many constraints already on speech. By the time people start getting to this question of, well, someone doesn't want me to like use racist speech about African Americans or something, or somebody doesn't want me to, you know, deny a genocide, that's so far beyond. I mean, those kinds of things are so far beyond the way we're already limited that it's kind of a weird discussion to have. Why do we pick those things when people don't even use the freedom we have? Why are we defending the freedom to to write a swastika on a wall? when we don't even use the basic freedom to use language in our own, um, in our own way. So I um, want to stress that. Um, I did say that technology, and, and I think technology does have some impact on the discussions we're having, but if you really look at free speech debates that happened in the 19th century, that happened um, in the mid to late 20th century around things like the civil rights movement, right? The use of free speech in the civil rights movement in the United States and you look at some of the debates we're having today, they're really very similar. The philosophical principles that are being discussed, the issues that come up, um, and the challenges are really similar. Different media, I mean, honestly, the shift from no printing press to printing press was more dramatic than any communications change we've had since then, right? Everything, I mean, kind of the interesting thing about social media is people have gone back to actually writing, right? We went to a sort of video um, tendency, I think in the 70s, 80s, 90s, television was sort of the king, and now people actually write more. I'm not saying they write better, but they write more. Um, and we've gone to a less, um, a less visual and talk, you know, direct oral communication is almost a lot art form, a lost art form in many ways, right? People don't. I, I call my kids on the phone. They're like, you call me on the phone? Are you kidding me? Right? So. So we've actually changed our, our, our way of speaking, but we're actually in a place where print or, or written words are very, very central um, to the issues that we're seeing. And that really goes back to the earlier debates around free speech, uh, you know, newspapers and so forth in the 19th century. Um, and the debates, uh, uh, Louis Brandeis, the Supreme Court in the 19th century, when they were dealing with gossip rags and all these kinds of things and trying to decide where the boundaries of free speech actually were. Um, so I'm going to sort of open by saying that, and then uh, shift gears a little bit um, to talk about um, sort of how speech relates to genocide. Um, and I think there are three maybe principal ways, at least for the purposes of tonight. The first thing is we know about genocide denial, right? People who are familiar, and, and let me expand that a little bit, it's not just about genocide. People deny slavery. Um, I mean, I'm, you think that doesn't make sense, right? But actually, if you read uh, people like Leah Greenfeld, who was a professor at Harvard when she wrote this book, uh, Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity, she basically denies that slavery was in any way important in the United States. She actually basically calls it a communist plot. Don't even get me started. It's a whole chapter of my dissertation. It doesn't make any sense, but she was very famous. This book was really famous. People were eating this stuff up. Um, so if we look at, if we look at um, the way that, that um, other kinds of past events get dealt with, any kind of past events where it requires confronting a reality people don't want to confront, there's denial. Okay? Mark um, was a key organizer four, three and a half years ago. Uh, oh, no, three years ago, actually. It wasn't even that long. Um, of, a, of a great conference um, with Nasser and Clark University um, and actually Worcester State and Rutgers um, that discuss the intersections among science denial and genocide denial. You know, climate change denial, smoking causes cancer denial, and other kinds of, of issues. Um, and so even there we see some of the same issues. Um, I don't want to simplify things, but I do want to stress that a lot of what we're talking about we've seen before. Okay, so denial about all sorts of stuff is a big thing. Um, it can command acts of genocide as well as other kinds of violence, right? And we kind of forget that, right? There is a kind of speech you can't use. You can't tell somebody to go kill somebody else, right? Um, and where the line of, uh, on hate speech that could be incitement to genocide comes up is, is somebody, where is that line where they're 
pushing or suggesting or creating a condition and actually doing a little bit more than that, right? So it's easy to say if a leader, you know, in Rwanda in 1994, um, one of the Inter Hamwe, um, gave an order to a killing squad to track down these people on this list and kill them, right? Clearly that speech is not acceptable. And that's actually in the genocide convention, incitement to genocide and giving orders, that kind of stuff, is, is outlawed. Um, but what about um, the uh, 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 Radio Milkaline, for instance, which was broadcasting hate propaganda incessantly to sort of create some of the conditions for the genocide, right? They were saying Tutsi should be killed. They are evil. They are destroying us, you know, whatever. They're raping your women. They're doing all this kind of stuff. Was that the same? Were, were people being told to go out and destroy excuse me, destroy the Tutsi? I might argue, yeah, that was what, I mean, read between the lines, that was what they were being told. If you don't do this, your society is dead. You got, you're, you're going to be killed if you don't kill, right? You create fear, you create stress. That's another, that's a way to do it. So the command is a complicated issue. What exactly is this? The other thing that's really significant is it can motivate, and this is, makes it even more complicated, right? It may not be about the possibility of killing today, but it may create a condition that makes genocide much more likely down the road, okay? Now, those who have been paying attention to politics in the United States over the last three years um, may have occasional shudders about the kind of rhetoric that we've seen in this country. Um, primarily Armenian audience, I'm guessing. Um, and so, probably everyone here, unless there's some secret across Alaska group of Armenians that came to the, to the Western Hemisphere 20,000 years ago or something. Everybody here is coming from immigrant roots, right? And so we can be kind of sensitive to understanding what the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we're seeing now is. As one of my 96-year-old my aunt has commented many times in response to what she's hearing, if people have these attitudes when my parents were trying to get over here after the genocide, or her mother after their father had gotten in earlier, they would be dead. They would, they, they would never have survived. Um, and so that kind of rhetoric creates a condition on which you lower the status of people. Okay, David Altman writes about this. Um, it's a really good article on free speech. Where you lower the, the status of people to the degree where it's acceptable to do violence to them. Right? So if you think about that, you're denying the, the full person, or you're denying the, the ethical status of, of people by a group attack, by a hate speech. Right? And it can be against you know, any group, again, we see this, I mean, some of the stuff in 1992, some of us are old enough to remember this, at the 500th anniversary of Columbus's quote-unquote discovery of America, there was actually a very interesting and fierce discussion in a lot of editorial newspaper pages, um, in actual newspaper pages that wasn't online at that time, um, that, that was, you know, bringing to light, really sort of bringing out um, anti-Native American um, deep genocidal hatred. Five minutes? Okay. I'm going to scoot, scoot through. So it can motivate, okay? Um, denial is a form of hate speech. I'll go back to Israel Charney, who I think did a great job in the early 90s, 90, 91, in there, in a number of articles talking about what genocide denial does. Among other things, it celebrates genocide and it mocks the victims. That's hate speech, right? Hate speech is where you, in some global way, that is some way that targets a group, you um, as I said before, you lower their status, you, you um, in some way insult them in a way that makes them less significant or less uh, ethically uh, acceptable and so forth than you are. Genocide denial does that, right? It celebrates, it mocks the victims, it sort of takes the, the vulnerability that they have and sort of makes it even worse, right? If we can think of it that way, okay? Um, what I would argue is incitement is an action through hate speech. Quite typically. It doesn't always have to be through hate speech, but it quite often is. It changes the ethical standards by which a society and people in that society make decisions. Right? If we get used to thinking about people in a way where they don't deserve rights, we lose the ability to recognize their rights. and It becomes much easier uh, to do things to them that we wouldn't otherwise do. And here's also something I think really important that we forget about. It provides an alibi or rationalization for acting on desires of cruelty and destruction. I won't get into that whole idea. Um, for both self-aware and unself-aware agents. What I mean is this. Nietzsche 
great philosopher, although incredibly <coughs> anti-Semitic and uh, racist and, and misogynist and so forth, but also understood violence maybe for those reasons quite well. <laughs> and one of the things that he talks about is the way in which we construct rationalizations that cover up the desires we actually have. Freud ripped all this stuff off from him and then didn't give him credit, but that, that we do this, right? So hate speech gives a, a, a cover to acting on desires of cruelty. When I see what's going on in the United States, all I see is people who love denigrating and harming others, but now they have a rationale to do it. They are coming to our shores and they're taking our jobs and they come up with all these reasons for it. But underneath it, they're just looking for somebody to be cruel to, okay? So that's something that's particularly dangerous about hate speech, is it liberates violence. It liberates the ability to do violence. All right, we're gonna see how quickly I can go through here. Okay, um, incitement with the fact, I'll just mention, we can talk about Rwanda, I mentioned it, birth of a nation and lynching, birth of a nation. Um, Woodrow Wilson referred to that 1915 classic of cinema history as history writ with lightning when it was screened at the White House. It's a film in which the KKK saves the United States from black people being free, essentially. We can talk more, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's a basic thing. And at places it was shown in the United States saw an increase in lynching. The Boston, Boston actually banned it. NAACP was able to get it banned in Boston because of that, right? So it's a film, it's art, you know, it's still referred to as one of the great films of all time in terms of, uh, in terms of the artistic merit, and it's true. Um, which makes it a little more frightening than just a bad film would have been. But people understood there was a direct connection between that film and violence against the minority group that was portrayed negatively in the film. Okay. All right. Well, we can go on. Uh, denial with effect. If you know about the United States, you know about Turkey, you've got that. Um, harm principle um, and speech. Um, basically, the idea, the only time you're supposed to in a liberal democracy um, uh, restricts speech is when it does material harm. And the argument is that things like genocide denial and hate speech more broadly are just words that don't do direct harm. I've been trying to make a, a case that that's not, not true. Um, incitement, I'll, I'll do a little bit, uh, a little bit quick here, but um, the thing about incitement is it's typically treated as an individual action, or hate speech is treated as an individual action. It's not looked at in its social context, right? A genocide is a social act. It takes people who are planners, it takes people who are inciters, it takes people who are killers, it takes people who are bystanders, it takes people who are um, the sort of cleanup crew after to cover up what's going on, and so forth. Ideologues and everything, right? Hate, it's true that hate speech, in the absence of these other things, might not be genocidal, but when it has some kind of connection to other potential things in the society, other parts of a perpetrator group, potential perpetrator group, then it becomes dangerous, and it becomes part of the act of genocide. Okay, so that's my argument there. I'm gonna finish up now. Um, same issue continued. We, I will just say that the very simple thing, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the very simple thing about denial is that denial makes the harms of genocide and other violence worse. When somebody speaks to an African American in a racist way today, it's not just the words in an isolated context today. If someone calls me, you know, like a white, like a cracker or something like that, I don't have a history of oppression as a white person where that matters to me in a significant way. It might make me feel bad or something like that, but that's, that's not the point. But if someone denigrates someone from a group that has suffered material, political, ethical, and other injustice over a long period of time, where the material effects are still here, that denigration actually makes the, the psychological traumatic impact of all those past harms, even in previous generations, more. When somebody denies a genocide, they're actually reaching back into the genocide and giving the original violence more power. Okay? And that's why I think genocide denial even is not just speech. It is an act that is connected to acts of violence in the past. Finish up? You got me? Okay. He usually brings a pain to pulling off <laughs> today. So, um, And I'm just going to finish with this quick concept. Um, I do think legal sanctions for genocide denial and hate speech that has the same kind of effect, and I think this is a broader question than, than genocide here, 
I do believe that that should be, uh, there should be accountability for that. That should not be acceptable legally. It certainly isn't ethically. Um, and, you know, sort of can map out those arguments I sketched just moments ago. We can talk in more detail if, if we want to bring question and answer. But essentially, um, there, there are harms being done. So even in the Western liberal tradition of the harm principle, hate speech and genocide denying speech and incitement do harm. Even if it's not direct or it's not the kind of harm we're used to seeing. And even within a liber uh, the libertarian idea of harm and harm principle, people should recognize that this speech is over the line. I will add, that doesn't mean I'm for criminal prosecutions. I know that was a bit, you know, France had the law um, that, that made people criminally liable for, for genocide denial. I don't think that's the right way to go, and I'll tell you why. The harm of genocide denial is, is not something that's simply punishing a perpetrator. That might deter it and all those kinds of things, but really what you need to do, and this is what people always say, right? Counter speech with more speech. Well, the trick is to get the people who are denying to pay for all that other speech, right? Because the job is not to prevent people from hearing ideas if people are going to say them, but rather to give them the tools to critically engage them. So if there's genocide denial, then those who are guilty of that, really, or in hate speech and other related forms, really should be on the hook to, to support broad education, museums, um, commemorative activities. Um, we were talking about street name or, or uh, geographical name changes you know, from indigenous groups to, to later groups through colonialism and genocide and so forth. All these kinds of things need to be on the table so that, so that what we can do is actually rehabilitate um, populations that are victimized by hate speech, which includes perpetrated groups themselves, whose minds, and Charney is great on this as well, who minds, whose minds really become narrowed and weakened by being subjected to these sort of inconsistent, um, totalitarian kinds of, of strategies of education and ideological indoctrination. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I probably have, yeah, thank you. All right, I got to the end, sort of. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it, and I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you uh, didn't have enough uh, material to fill the time, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's okay, try again next time. Um, I should mention too that of course afterwards uh, we will have a uh, discussion and uh, everybody will have the opportunity to hear more from our speakers. So, uh, there we go. discuss some of the questions and concerns of this panel through a law case, uh, as you see, between Dolperinček and Switzerland, handled by the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, who is Dolperinček? Let me have a few sentences about it. Dolperinček uh, is currently the president of Fatherland Party, Vatan Party, say, in Turkey, uh, which has a quite chauvinistic hardliner approach in, in politics, let's say. Uh, Erinček's political career is quite long and interesting, not to say doubtful. Uh, in 1960s and 70s, uh, he were engaged in leftist politics and jailed for these activities for a long time. Uh, and now get, let me give a brief background of the case. Uh, in 2005, he, I mean Perinček, delivered three public speeches in Switzerland in which he rejected that the events in 1915 and following years was a genocide. Uh, this is just an excerpt from his speech. I'm not going to read uh, line by line, but as you see, uh, he claims that this genocide is an international imperialist lie to divide Ottoman Empire, etc., etc., and what you didn't, what you did not see there is that he also add that 
uh, Turks and Kurds uh, just defended their fatherland. Yeah, is it there? Okay, yeah. then. Yeah, fatherland uh, in the face of this imperialist plot. Uh, but of course, these three switches are quite long. This is just an uh, excerpt to give you an uh, idea. Uh, then, the Swiss Servant Armenian Association lodged a criminal complaint against him after these speeches. And after trial, to make it fast, after trial, he was convicted on the basis of Article 261 of the Swiss Criminal Court that forbids hate speech and justification of genocide. And the date of this verdict is March 9, 2007. And he appealed the case, but his application was rejected by the Swiss Federal Court on December 12, 2007. And upon this, he forwarded the case to the European Court of Human Rights on 10 June 2008. The second section of the court, European Court, uh, decided on November 12, 2013 that there had been indeed a breach of his freedom of expression, which is protected by the Article 10 of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights. On 17 March 2014, the Swiss government requested that, that uh, the referral of the case to the Grand Chamber, which is an appealing organ within the European Court of Human Rights. And the request was accepted, and the hearing at the Grand Chamber took place on January 28, 2015. The Grand Chamber shortly agreed with the second section of the court and decided that Perinček's freedom of speech had been, had been violated by the verdicts of Swiss ju judicial orders. The decision was made by a majority vote of 10 to 7. Swiss courts, both lower and upper sections, thought that Perinček had had racist motivations in his statements and made racial discrimination. He used hate speech. Therefore, they claimed, I'm the Swiss judicial organs, claim to protect the human dignity of members of the Armenian community of Switzerland. In defense, Perinček said that he had not accused the victims, but the imperialists, imperialist states of falsifying history. The Turkish government, as a third party intervener, claimed that Perinček expressed his opinion and, quote, opinions couldn't be interfered it simply because the authority, the public authorities saw them unfounded, emotional, worthless, or dangerous, unquote. They claimed that his aim was not to denigrate the victims of 1915 or Armenians in Switzerland, but to trigger a public debate about Armenian genocide. So it is acceptable from their perspective that freedom of expression includes a certain degree of provocation, and this is what Perinček did, according to their explanation or defense. Perinček party, during all these trials, insistently forced the courts, both Swiss and the European Court of Human Rights, to examine the events of 1915 and have a judgment whether these events, quote-unquote, is a genocide or not. Uh, however, the European Court of Human Rights and the Grand Chamber openly declared that it is not their job and they are not authorized to determine or decide if the treatment of Armenians is a genocide or not. So they did not take any position in this question by saying that their responsibility was merely to judge if Perinček's right had been violated by the Swiss government. That's all we can do, they say. Now, two concepts that the Grand Chamber refers to in its decision to judge if Perinček's statements were incitement to violence and therefore to be sectioned are context and impact. And I think this is the point that connects this case with our topic today because some questions pop up. I mean, what are the borders of context in this era of social media? How can how uh, one can determine or the limit context 
And another question is how impact, I mean impact of speeches, can be measured again in this era of communication and, and social media. Let me turn to these questions at the end of my talk, but before, let me give some more details about how the Grand Chamber referred to context and impact in, this, in its world. The court, in assessing if interference to freedom of speech is necessary, considers whether statements in question are made against a tense political and social background, and if they, in immediate or wider context, are a direct or indirect call for violence or justification of violence. Therefore, in Perinchek's case, since there was no tense political atmosphere about the Armenian genocide in Switzerland, or a serious clash between Armenian and Turkish communities of Switzerland, they decided that the restriction of Perinchek's freedom of speech was not necessary. The court also noted that since the applicants, I mean Perinchek's statements, were made at three public speeches only, their impact had been bound to be rather limited according to interpretation of, uh, 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 of the European Court of Human Rights. So they said that basically he delivered just three speeches, and that's all. The impact of these three public speeches cannot be more extensive, let's say. The other question in which the court refers to context is the comparison of denial of the Holocaust and the denial of Armenian genocide, and the explanation of why the denial of Holocaust is punishable in a certain context, but the denial of Armenian genocide is not. The court claims that historical experience and political context should be considered in answering these questions. European states, including Switzerland, have had a tragic, exper tragic experience and memory of the Holocaust. Therefore, its denial in those countries, in those states, equals to anti-democratic ideology and anti-Semitism, even if, this is the word of the court, even if, it, it is presented as impartial historical research. Even under this category, in other words, they said that denial of the Holocaust is not acceptable, at least in European countries, because of all these Nazi experiences, etc. Holocaust denial is thus doubly dangerous, they say, especially in states which have experienced the Nazi, horror, the Nazi horrors. Therefore, for these states, it is a moral responsibility, according to the European Court of Human Rights, to distance themselves from the Nazi atrocities by outlawing its denial. Okay. On the other hand, the court contends that there is no such historical connection between Switzerland and the Armenian Genocide, which happened in remote places in Ottoman Empire some 90 years ago at that time, during the war. So, in, in another land, in a distant uh, past, so they, they said that there is no contextual and historical uh, connection. At this point, let me take your attention to a logical, but in a sense absurd, conclusion of this way of thinking. This implies that if Perinchek or someone else denies the Armenian genocide in Turkey today and is punished by the Turkish courts, the European Court, of, Court of, the European Court of Human Rights then would approve this restriction and punishment and support the Turkish government because Turkey has, an, although denying it, although has a heavy uh, memory about Armenian genocide. However, the court claimed that the situation of the Armenian community in Turkey couldn't be considered in this judgment because Swiss courts or Swiss government had not referred to Turkish context. So this is, as you see, a limited, uh, I think, a limited uh, uh, outlook. In sum, in, let's say, uh, short speaking, the European Court of Human Rights that claims to protect universal values and norms 
adopted a superficial and parochial approach in this case. It's obvious that the effects of neither Perinchek's statements nor the court's decision could have remained limited with Switzerland, and it didn't. The resonance of this de decision has been greater in Turkey than in Switzerland. Perinchek circles, their party, have been propagating since then that they ended the law of genocide, and thereafter no parliament can pass resolutions using the word genocide, according to their interpretation. Perinchek even said that they brought liberty to Europe after this case. And just, you know, uh, it's in Turkish, but basically it's a propagating piece in which, though Perinchek is that guy you see, <laughs> that top left, and say that they ended this lie of genocide. Similarly, it's a uh, picture from a TV stream. And again, it's a quotation of the translation of his remarks. Okay? And also, uh, this is again a tweet uh, by someone from TGB. TGB is the youth organization of Fatherland Party. And as you see how they propagate using this decision by European Court of Human Rights. I mean, just uh, 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 let me refer to Turkish context then. In the second half of the 2000s, there was a relatively liberal environment in Turkey to talk about the Armenian genocide. However, denialism and racism have been rising again for the last, say, seven, eight years or so. Uh, among numerous examples that I can give you, very recently, a criminal lawsuit has been initiated against the previous board members of the Diyarbakir Bar Association. Diyarbakir is a Kurdish speaking group. Uh, due to their declaration of sharing the lasting agony of Armenian people on April 24, 2018. As another example that you mentioned, a group of lawyers who called themselves nationalist lawyers wrote in their bulletin last month, very recent, that uh, they defend the deportation of Armenians. They defend this deportation yesterday, and today they continue conceptually, morally, to defend uh, uh, deportation. And uh, they said that they respect the memory of all Iddadis organizers of the deportation. And they said that for us, for them, let's say, uh, calling this event genocide would be a declaration of war in their eyes. Okay, surely the decision of the European Court of Human, Human Rights is not so even one of the primary reasons behind this rise of denialism in, in Turkey. And also, contrary to what the court expects, it's not easy to show the direct and concrete relation between Perinchek statements and the rise of denialism or racism in Turkey. However, political and social trends and movements are not mathematical equations in which coefficient of each variable can be detected easily and quantitatively. Okay? So, Populism and racism, as you know, is a global political atmosphere to which every piece of hate speech or justification of mass atrocities contribute. What is beyond doubt that social media multiplies the effect of these statements, hate speeches. I mean, there are some examples I took from Twitter again. I know. Uh, reading this kind of uh, statements might be disturbing for you, but just for the sake of giving some examples. Uh, this is a remark or statement uh, which I have the honor to be directly targeted by myself. Uh, as you see, um, I translate into English. Uh, as you see, it's an openly racist, whatever I mean, utterly, unshamefully uh, racist uh, remarks. But not personal. <laughs> Don't take it personally. Yes. It's because of my 
creation now is not complete. This is another, uh, and you see it's this is uh, a tweet, uh, let's say written in uh, April 24, 2007. And another very similar one. And this is very frequent. This, these kind of tweets are very frequent, uh, numerous. I just took few examples to give you an idea. So to conclude, I mean, if we or international organs, judiciary and political organs, if they want to prevent the repetition of mass atrocities to the extent of genocide or not, international political and judicial bodies, I think, should adopt a global outlook against global trend of discriminatory populism. I think this is the, the, the thing that in a nutshell that I can say. Thank you. considerations of the conversations the panel has been having so far. I want to talk about the, the idea of the difference between uh, hate speech and what is a hate crime. Uh, because hate crimes are legally punishable, but in most jurisdictions, hate speech is actually a protected right. And that is why in the United States, there is no legislation concerning uh, hate speech because it is deemed to be a violation of the First Amendment. And so the, the idea that speech does not lead to action I find problematic. In my work on genocide uh, that certainly isn't so. And so I think we create a false dichotomy between speech and action and I think part of that false dichotomy is created by this Latin aphorism facta non verbal action not words but the reality of it is that words actually lead to action and so as it pertains to what becomes genocide it always starts with speech every single genocide that i've studied across the world both modern as well as uh, historical genocides it started with a declaration with an assertion and primarily it starts with xenophobia the idea that those who do not belong should somehow uh, be expunged or removed. One cannot separate what is said from what happens primarily because genocidal violence is not spontaneous combustion and those who speak hatred are not lone wolves, they have listeners. So when thought leaders and demagogues speak, people listen and in listening they act. Those who are influencers and inciters cannot be absolved by declarations that I didn't kill anyone. And I think of many instances within the cadre of Nazi Germany that you have this hierarchy of responsibility. That those who gave the orders some, somehow felt that they could be absolved by saying, I didn't physically lead anyone to the gas chamber. But here it is, we're talking about the idea of responsibility. Uh, what I say in words, uh, it has consequences. We think of Rwanda. In 1994 and before 1994, the first pogrom in 1962 and then 1973, what happened? The Tutsi-led, the, the Hutu-led re regime begins to make this speech that says these people are Inyenses, cockroaches. And what do you do with cockroaches? You don't coexist with them. You don't make a habitus for cockroaches. You kill them. And so what begins to happen is that speech becomes the basis for genocidal action. So this idea that because I only say, then I can't be held responsible for what happens. Hate speech proceeds from hateful persons. If you speak hatefully, it's because you already hate the people you speak of. Um, as a Christian, I think of the biblical injunction, and it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you begin to first have hatred in your heart, and then you begin to articulate this hatred. Hatred is a choice 
just as genocides are choices taken by a group of people. Genocides are rational, deliberate calculations. They are systematic. I often say to persons that genocides are extreme nation building projects. Why? Because in this idea of freedom, some persons believe not everyone should have the same right of freedom. And so freedoms of speech and expression are protected rights, but as Henry said, they are not limitless rights. And so we often confuse the idea that because one has a right, it is a limitless right. All rights have uh, parameters and boundaries. They must be tempered by responsibility. And so hate speech has to be counted by responsible speech. Interestingly enough, the legal statutes make this distinction between illegal hate speech and legal hate speech. Because here it is, illegal hate speech are those that are not protected by freedoms of expression legislation. So you can have legal hate speech. So you can say, I hate all African Americans. If you have not incited violence in the United States, there is no such legislation that would charge you for committing a crime. But it becomes a crime when it is acted upon. And so when we talk about speech and the nature of action, I believe there is a causal, uh, there's a causal chain. If I am on a platform and I say that all Tutsis or all Hutus or all Jews or all Slavs or Muslims or Croats or Rohingyas should be killed or taken care of or we should provide a final solution. Though I did not directly kill anyone, I have incited others to do what I have spoken about. And therein lies a thin line between facts or speech and action. In terms of speech and the protection of freedom of expression, we look at the European uh, experience. In 2016, in May 31st, 2016, the European Union decides to essentially create conventions about responsible posting in social media. And so what begins to happen is that the largest social media platforms begin to monitor what is called hate speech. Again, as soon as they found it, they would remove it. But again, that does not remove the stinging consequence of hate speech. So we could continue to expunge them from social media. That doesn't solve the problem. Because what? People, again, reemerge under different screen names and under different identities. And so while there was a code of conduct among Facebook, Twitter, Instagram to remove any hateful speech in 24 hours, it did not remove the consequences of hate speech. That some groups were justifiably and unjustifiably targeted. So I want to define for us illegal hate speech because we've been talking about hate speech and I think it is important to define hate speech. According to the framework decision from the European uh, Human Rights Convention, uh, hate speech is defined as public incitement to violence or hatred directed to groups or individuals on the basis of certain identities, race, religion, color, descent, or ethnic origin. And so it's illegal primarily because it is public incitement to violence. Hate speech in the United States is articulated as freedom of expression. And therein lies part of the challenge of talking about hate speech in America. Until it becomes a crime, it is not punishable by law. And actually, uh, in American jurisdictions, hate speech is a protected um, freedom of expression. So can we strike a balance between freedom of expression and the right for everyone to feel a sense of protection within the jurisdiction that they live. And that becomes a challenge of allowing hate speech to flourish. In this idea that the internet is democratic, I argue that it is more um, anarchic than democratic. Uh, the idea that everyone is entitled to their opinion is not the same as saying there are no prohibitions for problematic opinions. So we've almost abandoned our reason in this idea to push this notion of democracy. 
And every time I think of democracy, I go back to uh, Greco-Roman societies where, according to Aristotle, it was the best of the worst forms of government. But in our jurisdiction, democ democracy is articulated as the ideal. And so the U.S. has no hate speech legislation because, as I said, hate speech uh, is interpreted as a violation. To deny hate speech is interpreted as a violation of the First Amendment. According to the FBI, a hate crime is a traditional offense like murder or arson, uh, but for their purposes, it is a criminal offense against a person motivated by the person's identity. And so the FBI is more concerned with protecting freedom of speech rather than protecting vulnerable populations, based on its own understanding and reading of what is hate speech. I want to look at the German example because, because of the experience with uh, the Jewish Holocaust, Germany passed legislation uh, to prohibit incitement to hatred. Germany has um, in its penal code, section 130, this idea that incitement to hatred through speech is punishable by up to five years in prison. And, and it is interesting because whether or not the hate speech happens in Germany or outside of Germany, it is protected and it is punishable. In other words, even name calling, calling someone of a minority group words such as maggots or vermins was also punishable by five years. And I found that interesting because uh, I think Germany also has learned from the reality of the Holocaust. Uh, and so this penal code, even the idea of calling groups of people uh, freeloaders or maggots was prohibited. A very interesting part of the German paradox is that many of those who are protected by such uh, legislations are actually from descendants from populations that deny the Armenian genocide. Because many of those protected by those legislations are indeed Turks uh, who are often treated uh, to second citizen status in Germany. The other, society, the other society I want to contrast is with Rwanda. Because here we have Rwanda uh, having a genocide in April 1994 that between April 6, 1994 and July 10, almost a million Rwandans are killed. Once the genocide happens, what begins to be passed as legislation are two very interesting um, prongs of legislation. Genocide minimization became enshrined in law. So the idea of minimizing uh, the Rwandan genocide was punishable in law. The second, was the spreading or propagandizing of genocide ideologies. Both of these are now codified in law. But again, one argues whether or not this legislation denies people the right to speak what they wish. So we can argue that hate speech is dangerous and can lead to dangerous actions such as genocide. But much of the post-genocide legislation in Rwanda has limited freedom of speech because one is not uh, therefore um, protected in speaking about genocide. So while we talk about social media and the anarchy that exists in social media, I want us to look at the reality that in many ways social media is very difficult to police uh, or to uh, provide jurisdiction. Why? Because we live in a transnational global a uh, borderless world where the idea of the internet denies this very idea of policing. And so finally, I want to talk about the question of what can we do. I think one of the challenges of establishing cross and transnational structures to prohibit incitement to violence is first understanding that speech has consequences. I think most of us uh, are willing to say people should be uh, able to express their minds. That expression, however, has become dangerous in many instances. I think again of the Rwandan genocide where the propaganda argued that these people will kill. And so in order 
to not be killed by them, we should provide, similar to Hitler's final solution, we should send them back up the Nile River. Now, there is nothing in there that said kill them. It said send them back up the Nile River. So again, there is a gray area between what is spoken and what is meant. And if we think of Jürgen Habermas and the idea of the notion of exit and voice, the spoken word has far more consequences in many instances than the written word. Why? Because when you speak, people listen. And uh, much of that listening prompts itself in action. I'll stop here and um, I'll leave the rest for discussion. Thank you. I think for me, broad, broad base and across the board punishment would be problematic because each uh, society has had different experiences. And so when you think of the way in which the Founding Fathers established the American um, Republic and you, you have this idea of the importance of freedom of expression because one was not able to criticize the monarchy. As, and so that tradition of the First Amendment uh, protects freedom of speech, but as I tell students in my philosophy class, freedom has consequences. And so your ability to speak freely and to say what's on your mind carries with it a related and associated consequence. And so I think that is part of the challenge where do we, um, do we provide uh, no boundaries for speech and for expression because there are other rights and where your speech uh, ends, mine begins, your freedom. And so if we look at freedom as a compact within um, the social contract, then no one has the, uh, should have the right to say explicitly and exclusively everything they want to say. So I think in my mind, it's important to move beyond just speech, but to move beyond uh, criminalizing speech, uh, which is why when we talk about hate crimes, it's not just the, um, the display of swastikas or, or, or hoods or uh, uh, nooses that should be punished. It should be the very idea of articulating the voice that allows these kinds of symbols to be drawn. That's a, a great question, I mean, and a subtle question that we could probably spend a lot, of, you know, a lot more time on. Um, one thing I did want to note, though, um, one of the things that gets often elided is when people talk about the price of democracy being things like hate speech, mm -hmm. they neglect to talk about who pays that price. It's not everybody in the society, right? Um, so if you're looking at Turkey today, who pays the price of hate speech? Armenians, Greeks, Jews, and other, other um, uh, residual minority groups. And, and Kurds, obviously, and actually some Turks do, right? The kinds of Turks who are outside, the left-wing Turks and so forth. So I think that's something we have to pay attention to because I think the ideal democracy, right, is that while everybody sort of sacrifices some freedom or, or accepts some harm for full freedom or whatever it is, it's but it's not an even, it's not an even thing across the board. Some people get freedom of speech and other people get targeting, right? And that's a huge difference. And it's also significant that the people who are targeted 
often cannot exercise free speech because they don't have access to the means to do it. They don't run the newspapers, right? They don't own these kind, you know, and all these kinds of things. And so it makes it much more complicated in a real world than in an ideal democracy. That said, what I would say, um, and, and you actually caused me to, to think a little bit more about this on the criminal law side. Um, the reason why I, I don't think that criminalization in the sense of sending someone to jail is helpful is because I'm less concerned about the person doing the hate speech than I am about the impact of the hate speech in the society. Yeah. And so what I'm really concerned about is what damage does that hate speech do and how do we counter it, right? So I would go beyond. I, I wouldn't just say, I think the person is, on, is responsible for apologizing for the hate speech. And this is something I've actually learned a lot from Jermaine about, about the, what we'll call meaningful concepts of apology. That the person you know, is on the hook for correcting the historical record, actually you know, not lying about it, right? Um, and, and, and so forth. And I think there are other, other things, right? So there's a monetary piece in terms of like, yeah, you should be contributing money to make sure the right you know, the textbooks are published that are, you know, that are truthful and things like that. Um, but on the criminal side, here's the distinction I would draw. I do think hate speech, and it doesn't have to be the kind that we would, we would see now, right? So if a mafia boss orders the killing of someone, that's punishable by mur as murder, right? It doesn't have to be that direct. It can be hate speech. When it does lead to violence, I think you are criminally responsible for that. But we can't know that it will lead to violence until it does. That's the catch-22. So how do we deal with those situations? How do we stop that speech or interfere with that speech before it gets to violence? And that's where I think the idea of civil law or tort becomes very useful. Because we're able to make people responsible at some level for correcting the speech. Um, and then when it actually becomes violence, we hold them accountable for that violence, which, is a, which are two different things, right? So I feel like if you are going to engage in hate speech, anti-immigrant hate speech, anti-Native American. Um, I, by the way, was very struck by the similarity of the quotes that you had from people who said, oh, there wasn't a genocide, but damn, I wish there was, uh, <laughs> or wish there had been, to what happened in 92. I mentioned the, the debates in, in the US. Some of the calls for genocide against Native Americans, it was the same exact rhetoric of, well, we didn't commit genocide, but boy, I'm glad we did, or boy, I wish we had a and Charney actually talks about that contradiction that's fascinating, right? We didn't do it, but I'm so happy we did. You know, like it's, it's a bizarre thing. So anyway, I would say that that criminal responsibility, if you're, if you're taking the risk by saying things that could incite violence and violence happens, you know, you throw a match, a burning match in the forest and there's a forest fire, you're responsible. You may not have, you may say, I just lit a match. I didn't light the whole forest on fire, but you have. Yes. Yeah. There is a problem though because when a, a member of the group that has been oppressed out of frustration engages in hate speech in reverse, uh, I mean, should that be held as, as criminal or as problematic? Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. like when, when, I mean, both in kinds mm -hmm. of ethnic situations or in, in terms of like, uh, in communities where there is police violence against mm -hmm. minority groups and a member of the minority group just, just explodes and says something you know, derogatory about all police, you know, is that hate speech? Um, I, I, it's not a genocidal situation, but I think of South Africa uh, when the ANC was being brought um, to testify in front of the South African Truth Commission post 1994, they made the argument of just war theory that the idea that we fought a just war, and so if we had to use violence to counteract the oppression that we were um, obtaining, it should not be judged by the same standard. And, and I'm willing to explore the, the reality that if uh, speech is directed uh, to counteract uh, hate, um, it's still hate, uh, but I think we can provide um, some 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 greater proscriptions as to how we understand uh, the origin of it. Because one is coming, the violence of the oppressor and the violence of uh, the oppressed uh, to, to, to relinquish their oppression can't be, can't be uh, covalent. And so in my mind, I think we'll have to uh, provide a better notion of how and whether or not we can call that uh, hate speech. 
uh, we may speak about it as reactionary speech or responsive speech. Uh, but I think it would be, um, in my mind, morally problematic to, um, to, to weigh them uh, using the same scales. But then the presumption is that uh, the person who has incited the violence in the first place and victimized the reacting party would understand that, oh yes, they were in the wrong in the first place. So it's, I, I, I'm talking in terms of, so, so my perspective is in terms of, the, again, the question of um, well, well, Henry used, any speech or not. But Henry used an example earlier, and then I'll, uh, oh, um, yeah. you know, Henry used an example earlier about, um, say, uh, uh, someone of Caucasian descent using the term cracker. Um, and so, if we think of the origins of many of these terms and and how and what they mean, uh, they mean different things to different groups. So, if I were called the N word. It means something quite different because I'm coming from a group that has been victimized by that word. And so the question of speech has to be tied to the nature of victimization or whether or not those fomenting the speech are the oppressed or the oppressor. So I think in my mind, we have to look on those. As an answer to this question, I, think I will again refer to context and you know yes. power relations. Mm -hmm. is always an important part of this context. Yes. And, I mean, your example, your hypothetical example, just, I mean, reminds me, and, and, and again, another hypothetical situation. For example, let's think about Armenian community in here, let's say in Boston. Yeah. Uh, or some members, let's say, some members of Armenian community using hate speech against Turks here in Boston, uh, residing in Boston, working in Boston, or engaged in hate crime against these Turks, then, I mean, is this suitable? I mean, what you define? Is this a just example, uh, what you say? I mean, so, uh, again, the context and the power relations uh, should be considered, uh, again, case by case. I think it's difficult to determine abstract principles, I think, in judging yeah. hate, hate speech and punishment of hate speech. Uh, if I can add, uh, you've asked a, you've posed a really important question. Nadine Strassen, who is the longtime president of the, of the um, a, uh, LC, a, ACLU, God, it's been a long day, um, uh, has a great article from about 1992 about campus hate speech, and she makes the argument actually that one of the problems with campus hate speech uh, rules is that they are disproportionately applied to the very groups who are typically targeted by hate speech. The problem with her actual data is when she starts talking about concrete examples, she references, for instance, I think he's an African-American man at the University of Michigan who made a homophobic comment, right? So it's a little bit, it's not exactly the kind of situation you're saying, which I think is rarer than, than actually we, we present. And I think there's a perception issue. Um, I think, uh, actually, I'll go to John Stuart Mill again. He, he mentions at the end of his chapter on freedom of expression and opinion, yeah, I think that's it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, freedom of thought and opinion, that, um, that, there, that no matter sort of how rational those in the minority are, now he's talking about a political minority, but we can extend that, you know, because we see that line up with, with actual stat, you know, identity status as minority. Um, that no matter how rational the arguments they give, no matter how clear, well thought out, how factually based, by those who are in power and sort of control the discourse, they're always perceived as irrational, aggressive, um, dangerous, destabilizing, and so forth, right? Strident, he uses the term strident, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So automatically, um, we put people who say things we're uncomfortable with, right, in that category. African American person talking about reparations for slavery 10 years ago was in that category automatically. Could give the best argument ever, right? So the question becomes much more how we perceive what people are saying than what they're actually saying. And I think if you look at the difference between sort of that kind of speech and, and what, you know, sort of, I'll say KKK types in the US, there's very little sort of so-called reverse racism 
and a lot more of this other speech, and this speech has impact. Let me add one more, one more point, um, and this goes back to the power issue. Um, and, and again, I think it tied, pulls together a couple things that you said. Um, there's a difference between hateful speech and hate speech. Hate speech has an impact, and it has an impact precisely because of the historical context, precisely because the way that historical context, and Jermaine's work on this is excellent, the way that historical context structures the present realities in which people have positions to speak in a society, right? And so when a Native American in the United States says, I really hate white people, they're talking about a group who has committed genocide and all sorts of other stuff over centuries against their group. That's a very different statement from me saying, well, I hate Native Americans, right? As someone identified as white, sort of piggybacking on this history of genocide in this card, which I think is what you were both, what you were saying. So, I, yeah. I, I agree, yeah. but the problem is that, that's what I'm trying to say, that the boundaries between context mm -hmm. getting blurred in this mm -hmm. era of Absolutely. communication, yeah. in this era of social media. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what, yeah. what's set in Switzerland, for example, yeah. does not remain in Switzerland. Right. That's, that's the yeah. new paradox, mm -hmm. if you like, of, mm -hmm. of, of this uh, era. And you know, if I can say another uh, act. You know, when you say punishment, inevitably you call for state into a domain. And for me, there is another purpose, because if you invite state, mm -hmm. it comes. But it does not stop when you say stop, or it does not go away when you request. Okay, so that's the problem with this hate speech and its punishment. So it calls inevitably it calls for a vertical hierarchical relation between citizens and <coughs> states. And once state is in, most probably it wouldn't go away when you wish mm -hmm. it go away. That's that's I mean, but there's no solution for it as far as I see. I just I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to drag this out, but I think you misunderstood what I'm trying to say. I, I, I don't disagree with any of your qualifications and explanations of, or contextual uh, view. What I'm saying is that if, if you make hate speech, hate speech a form of crime, then when a frustrated you know, person of a black community, when there is riots going on, says kill all these police and people start attacking police, then he is also going to be uh, held accountable because of what he said. Therefore, I'm questioning whether hate speech should actually be left alone. And in other words, I'm, I'm wondering, in other words, yeah. When you restrict freedom of speech, you're also restricting the freedom of speech of people who want to speak up against something. So I'm not saying that it is bad or as good or whatever. I'm not making any moral judgment. Right. I'm just say, talking about... But what you said, if someone says, you. let's kill all the police, and then there's violence against police, they are legally punishable okay. for saying that. I mean, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. But it's I mean, the hate speech. I mean, oh no, that's beyond hate speech. That's a that's a different. I okay. think that's a different issue. It's, it's, it's inciting violence. It's inciting yeah. violence, but it's it's giving a, it's 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 actually resulting in violence. And I think okay. when you say if you said I hate police, yeah, that's a very different thing. And you're not gonna you know that you could make an argument that's hate speech. But I think in the context, if you have reasons for saying it, again, the kinds of things we're talking about, then you can say that. What if they said something in between? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's all police should be dead. I just didn't want to be misunderstood that. Yeah. I, I was thinking a practical yeah. point, right. not a moral point. Right. There is another quite frequent misunderstanding. I mean, as you say, hate speech should be directed to ethnic, religious, and uh, uh, racial communities or groups. For example, did that instance. Is police, that category is mm -hmm. such an ethnic, racial, or... Victimized, no, yeah. Ethnic, but, so that is yeah, a few from our yeah. groups. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, abundance and ready access uh, that people have to hate speech of the kind that, that Ohanes uh, gave us a few examples of uh, on social media has um, normalized uh, that kind of speech? Or do you think or it doesn't have to be either or. Does it does it also have the potential of uh, perhaps belatedly sensitizing people to the existence 
uh, of this as well. I mean, I think for me, language changes over time, and in, in many instances, what was once acceptable uh, in ways we describe people uh, in another iteration becomes unacceptable. So I, so I teach a class and we're talking about um, the politics of language and we say we no longer say handicapped or disabled, we say differently able. Uh, but there was a time when that was what people said and there was no moral opprobrium against calling someone a handicap. And so I think language changes over time. What the internet does and what social media does is that it makes everyone a purveyor of knowledge, even if it's uh, problematic, even if it's false, even if it's morally objectionable, but everyone now becomes uh, a purveyor of knowledge just because one has the ability to post something. And so uh, we are not in the marketplace of consequences, we're in the marketplace of ideas. Everyone says something because they're free to say it, um, and so the other day I noticed uh, Facebook changing its user policy to talk about now removing, um, you know, again, but it's a problematic policing because to use, uh, to use her example, persons who were then attacking uh, some uh, ultra-right uh, white groups for being racist because mm -hmm. their language was strong, mm -hmm. they were the ones that were actually censured. And so in this idea, where social media is not a democratic space, um, it's, I still think it's an anarchic space, and so I think language changes over time, and so how we think of these things now, I'm not convinced whether or not we'll think of them in the same way um, years from now, because I think part of the challenge is how our language quotient and how our understanding of how, um, I would say, you know, these things are processed. Uh, I just could add a, add a couple things. Um, it's a great question. Um, one thing I would say is, and I, and I was trying to maybe convey this and maybe didn't do it effectively, that um, I'm probably in the minority in the United States now in thinking that some, that rehabilitation in many cases is much more important than punitive concepts of, you know, punishment in the sort of classic sense of just making suffer. Restorative justice. Yeah, and, and, and I think there, that, that that's, what you're posing is, is puts us in the, in the position of asking, is this a teachable moment we talk about this in academia, right? Is this a teachable moment or not? If a 12-year-old kid engages in what we would call hate speech, that's very different, you know, some 12-year-old kid somewhere, very different from a 30-year-old, you know, member of the some neo-Nazi group, right, white supremacist group, using the same speech, right, the same utterance, not because of what it means, but because of the context, who's saying it, and the intent behind it, the educability of the person, right. So what I want to do with that 12-year-old is start to have a conversation, right. You can punish, right. You can't say that. Here are the rules. Those kinds of things. But then you can begin a process of education because the chances are that the reason this kid was saying these things is not that he or she thought it up, you know, in some vacuum, but because that's what they're exposed to in their environment, right? So we want to try to deal with that environment. Um, I would add um, one other thing. On Terrence State Prey, there, I think there are two great articles over everything, and I've actually published on this, and these are much better than the things I've done. Um, I mentioned Israel Charney's work in the early, uh, around 1990, 92, actually in the Nasser uh, Journal. He has one of, one of the great articles on, on freedom of speech and genocide denial. Terence Dupre in the Yale Review of, I can't remember what month, but it's 1986, has something called On Governing Narratives, and that's the other great piece. And what he argues in that article, using sort of Foucault meets Armenian genocide denial by Turkey and the Cold War, um, which is a pretty interesting thing, he argues that free speech has actually changed its political impact. Originally, and you can even see this in the United States, I mentioned this during the Civil Rights Movement, the protection of freedom of speech was a protection that was exercised by those outside of power. Mm -hmm. What's happened through things like, you can see this, Turkish state denial of genocide, is that those in power now are the ones who use freedom of speech against the powerlessness. And he said that's a new problem for us because simple adherence to principles of free speech don't work anymore. Um, and this is, you know, we call it the postmodern condition and so forth. And I think that's the age that we're in, is it's not so simple to protect all speech. You, you mentioned the anarchy of the internet and, and different issues with social media in terms of the, the 
borderlessness of, yeah. of hate speech now and the easy transmission of it and so forth. We're in a new, and maybe so I stand corrected, social media does affect things even more than what happened, what was going on in 1986. But we're in a different, different age where freedom of speech means something different. It's the same thing as reverse racism in the Bakke versus California uh, decision, I think in 1990, where a white person claimed to be the victim of racism because they didn't get into med school. Right? So uh, in the University of California system, because of racial um, preferences that, that I don't think were super high preferences, but we can, we can talk about that as well. Um, again, the fear of prejudice in hiring now is something that's exercised by those who have been advantaged in hiring for, for generations and suddenly we're in a position where they were no longer, or we were no longer advantaged, treating that loss of entitlement as a victimization. And I think that's one of the problems, right? So um, we have, there's all sorts of attitudinal issues we have to look at as well. I saw a hand over there. Oh, yes. Yeah, hi. Um, so do you think legislation can play just as big a role in um, genocide as hate speech does? Because essentially, mm -hmm. legislation is allowing these acts of violence to occur, most likely due to hate speech in general. Do you want to? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, Ideally, for me, uh, rather than a legislation of punishment, I know this is maybe seems very hypothetical or utopic even, it should be a, 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 a horizontal relation between citizens to suppress all this hate speech and, and if you like, eradicate it. It's possible to eradicate this hate speech and hate crime. Uh, otherwise, as I say, through legislation, through panel calls, etc., etc., you you establish a hierarchical relation, vertical relation, which is difficult to get rid of. That's why, that's why I said that uh, I prefer uh, a horizontal relation between citizens through education, mm -hmm. maybe, and then through other civil society engagements, etc., to, to suppress and eradicate uh, this. But if I, again, back to Turkish context, on the other hand, mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of hate speech and racism is so expensive and so deep that I couldn't imagine, on the other hand, how you can deal with in such a context with, with just this uh, horizontal relations or interstitial relations. So the answer is that again, maybe in the United mm -hmm. States, the uh, mechanisms, uh, legal or extra legal, might be different. Uh, in somewhere else to cope with, to deal with all this hate speech and racism. When you said legislation, <laughs> what, what, what jurisdiction you were talking about, generally or in the United States? Um, I think in the United States it might be different, since uh, it is, I guess it is a crime too. Um, so, so hate crimes are distinct from hate speech, and, and I think that is part of the problem in the United States, because uh, the, in the European context, uh, they have legislation across several countries uh, that prohibits uh, hate speech. Uh, in the United States, only hate crimes are, 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 are punishable or prosecutable. So I think the challenge becomes, what would be the incentive uh, to remove the protection um, under the First Amendment? Because that is what it would require. Uh, because hate speech is now uh, protected under the First Amendment. Um, and it is and that is why so many states have refused to even um, prosecute some, some aspects of hate crime that are not physical or that don't involve the physical depiction of violence, um, either in visual form or physically targeting someone, because they are strident that to do so would be to deny and to obstruct the First Amendment. So, so it's less likely that um, you know, those kind of legislation as what have been passed in about 10 European countries would happen in the U.S. And so may I have an example of course, again, yeah. again from Turkey? You know, uh, in the Turkish Penal Code, there's an Article 301, which forbids the insult to Turkishness. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, insult to Turkishness is an example of hate speech. Mm -hmm. But the trick is that that article uh, has been used against powerless people uh, to suppress them, to oppress them. For example, I mean, the late Grand Pink. Grand Pink was tried 
by this Article 201, uh, allegedly that he was insulted to Turkish people as an example of hate speech. So what I'm trying to say is that legislation or, or a panel court might be twisted at the, at the hand of these uh, power holders and suddenly you, you can face uh, uh, as, as a someone who is accused of hate speech. I mean, remember the quotation by Pinchin. You know, he it, he talentedly twisted the discourse yeah. and used Hitler yeah. as an example to justify his own position. So this kind of jurisdictions, legislation, whatever panel courts, but I'm sure is, is sliding and it's very sloppy. So you can you can you can lose the control of it, depending again again the context. And, oh, I'm sorry, can I quickly just address it, um, add, add a couple things? And one is it is interesting, I mean, what he was really doing was connecting Hitler to Armenians, right, who are yeah. making these things yeah. of genocide, and it's not hate speech, okay. Um, and it's also very interesting, I always, I'm just always struck by this, and it's not to pick on Turkey any, as, as an exception in this case, because I think a lot of countries, including the US, have dramatic contradictions, but the fact that Turkey, um, is really good at arguing freedom of speech cases in the United States, and in the case of Massachusetts, um, with the genocide curriculum bill and the whole issue over whether denialist material should be given to schools, you know, on, on a list along with legitimate sources and all those kinds of things. They're great at arguing that stuff, and yet in their own country, they're they're like leading the world in jail journalists for precisely, you know, doing the things that if that they claim yeah, everybody else true. around the world should be able to do. So it's, it's, you know, right there it raises some real motivation questions. Um, but I think, I don't believe that, that um, and, and I'm very attuned to what you're saying, Anas, I think you're exactly right, that when you open the door to an authority, being given more authority over, over issues, right, there's going to be abuse that's going to come in, and, and we've been talking about that. Um, but I'm not sure... At the same time, it's sort of the military intervention against genocide versus other alternatives. In some cases where the killing is happening, maybe there's no choice, right? And, and, I, and I hesitate a lot because I think military intervention usually has such horrible consequences down the road, but maybe there's no choice, right? And so we have to weigh that even though that's not really gonna, it's gonna have a lot of bad effects and it sends the wrong message and, and so forth, right? So maybe we're in a situation where there is no perfect mechanism, but law might be an important lever at times to counterbalance the power base of those who would um, use hate speech to perpetrate violence, including genocide. Um, I would argue, and I say this uh, you know, from an Armenian perspective, Armenia has been terrible historically at doing this as a, as a people and as a country and so forth, and we see it today. Um, but when you're in a vulnerable position, one of the things that you can do to survive well, you know, decently is to be able to understand how those with power are operating relative to one another and, you, and, and, and sort of work those, those power balances enough in your favor to carve out a territory of some kind of safety. Okay? And I think for vulnerable groups, it's not about should we put all our faith in the law or should we put our faith in social change and, and so forth. It's, it has to be more tactical in the sense that law might be really appropriate in this or that circumstance to, to sort of pull us away from an extreme. But if we rely too heavily on law, that's going to push us in, into another extreme. We're going to lose something. And so it's a very dynamic and very difficult problem, I think, to, to, to do the, deal with this. And that's why I'd say blanket, I think both of you have said this, sort of blanket, simplistic rules about speech really don't help us because the questions are so subtle and complicated. What we really need are legal decision makers, political decision makers, who study these things with a lot of nuance, and a lot of them don't. And so they make decisions, and I think the European Court of Human Rights, unfortunately, some of the decision aspects you know, are stunning in how simplistically bizarre they are, if I can say it that way. They're, they're just really poorly reasoned. Um, and so it may be a question of how do we get to a point where if we're going to have laws and we apply them, the people doing it really understand the subtleties and the problems that you've been raising in the back, can really see these complexities so that we're not creating more problems than we're solving with legislation or with, not, and, uh, with being against legislation, for instance, right? So. Uh, the, in the fourth row, the woman in red. <laughs>
I, 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 one of the questions I was going to ask Jermaine was the definition of freedom. Yes. So, in our the, the freedom of speech, what was the actual intent of that term at that time? I think when we look at uh, the configuration of the uh, American Republic, uh, so much of it was based on this mistrust of power. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of what became enshrined as the Constitution was uh, to ensure that the, the monarchical excesses were never repeated by a government constituted uh, by what became America. And so if we put that in, in context, I think one of the distinctions that is often not made is that something can be legal and be immoral. Um, and I think that is part of the challenge of freedom of speech and freedom of expression, that one may be legally permitted to say what one wants, but it may not be morally the right thing to do. And so I think, um, you know, obviously I wasn't there when it was crafted, but I think, <laughs> but I think, part, of, uh, I think part of the challenge uh, of freedom of expression is that it was never designed to be limitless. Right. And so we have come to hold it up in the same way we do the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms. But that is not the only dimension of the Second Amendment. So I think what is important is that we, we are not splicing uh, and cut and pasting uh, what is applicable. The right to freedom of expression had very specific limitations. Yes. And it could not impinge upon someone else's right to be free. Right. That is the part that is often left off of freedom of expression, that it cannot impinge on someone else's right to be free. And it was also within Correct. a societal context. It was a social was, contract. That was so much more, the, they were all the same, more or less. It didn't apply to... It didn't apply to women, it to, didn't apply to uh, blacks, it didn't apply exactly. to Native Americans, it applied to property in white males. That's correct. So and that was a more, um, you know, uh, unilateral group. Right. And, 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 and in that time, a more educated group. And I think, Henry, what you had begun with in the notion of your opening comments about freedom of speech and that we are all constrained by our societal mores and and that in this international context that the internet has created, we are now all thrown together with completely different societal norms and uh, social contracts that I... In the anonymity, or potential anonymity, right. of the internet also takes off some of those shackles of uh, uh, self self censorship yeah but so yeah the notion of your horizontal citizens monitoring each other that when you have a group as large as the entire world with such a variation of you know it's not even necessarily education although obviously that comes into it but just such a variety of what is right and wrong. Man, please allow the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I think, but I think part of the challenge is that when we think of how the internet uh, is not only generated, but how it operates, it's that not everyone is creating content equally. Correct. And so there is control, because almost all of the largest social media outlets originate in the United States with the exception of those such as Weibo uh, that originate in China. And so the very idea of the creation of content is still specific to a particular group of people. So even this hypocrisy of this idea that everyone can create, uh, everyone can use, but not everyone generates the same measure uh, of content creation and also content consequence. Because we often don't look at that when we talk about freedom of expression. Because the reality of it is that I think of the, 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 the animal farm expression, uh, Napoleon says, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. 
right? And, and so we think of it democratically, but uh, it is, as Oana said, it is hierarchical. And those at the top are stratified in such a way that those who uh, generate content at the bottom don't have the same consequences as those who own and control uh, the outlet through which the content comes. So can I, uh, can I add one other thing, too, that, that I think um, that sort of comes out that maybe we haven't discussed. There, there, there are a lot of different motives for this kind of speech. And in some cases, we've been sort of assuming that hate speech, and, and you said this, and I think this is a great point that you made, that hate speech shows something deep about the person speaking it, right? It's not a coincidence, you don't just choose words. But I think at times, um, hate speech functions in a very complicated relationship to the mental activity of the person. Hate speech um, is transgressive, right? So people who feel disempowered, who feel like you know they, they're, they're blocked in certain ways, often engage in shocking speech. Sometimes it's legitimately, interestingly shocking speech. But sometimes it's, you know, I mean, it's the Lenny Bruce kind of stuff, but sometimes it's, it's this more, um, more horrific kind of, of speech. Um, but they're doing it because it gives them a sense of power from a position of dis disempowerment. I'm not legitimizing it all. No. Um, and I think that, that um, one of the issues now thinking about this idea of social media, one of the issues is that's historically been true, right? People could say sort of radical things um, as a transgressive act. But it wasn't that easy, right? You had to get printed in a newspaper for it to mean anything. You had to have a lecture organized. You had to have an audience, right? So you, if you were going to speak, your audience was limited to who was around you. Now with, with social media, with all the kinds of internet-based um, ways of disseminating speech, when somebody transgresses in that way, it can, it can be transmitted in all sorts of places that go far beyond that sort of psychological problem that person had who made that speech and can have an impact where people actually act on this speech even if that wasn't, and again, I'm not excusing the person saying it, even if that person, him or herself, wouldn't have acted on that speech. Does that make sense? So it amplifies the effect in a way that's robbed us of, of sort of the slowness of dissemination of speech that we've had in the past. Um, oh, thank you. Um, you just, I've been wanting to say this, but thank you, Henry. For, uh, getting to the individual. I want to talk on a personal level. I am in the process of severing ties with a friend who I found out was very racist, and his roots go back to Nazi Germany. His mother was in the Hitler Youth. And it's very, you know, it's very painful to go through this because he was not like this before President Obama became president. What he did was he put hate speech on social media. I do not do Facebook. My, my wife does. It just happens that my daughter-in-law is a writer for The Daily Show, Trevor Noah, right? So he put out some, when she got that job, she let everyone know how happy she was. And he sent this horrible stuff. And I, uh, you know, it, that's it. I mean, this is a personal level. It's not the world Ex expanded out into the, the, the social media in the world, but it, well, it is, huh? It's a, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of unfriending going on, but I'm not in, I'm not on Facebook, but I'm, this, I mean, anyway, it's just bringing this out with me, so. Well, the point you make is actually important um, in the social context of the United States right now, and I think in, Europe, in many places in Europe and, and in other places, where one of the dangers is hate speech create, you know, entitles or empowers more hate speech. Um, and I think that's what we've seen in the United States. It legitimizes more hate speech. And then we have this cascade, right? If, a, if one person on the fringe is saying something really horrific, that can be argued against, right? It doesn't seem like that's the valence of a society. That's the way a society is going. But when these kinds of things catch on, right? So I'll say, the President of the United States says some hateful things about immigrants. That authorizes other people to say the same thing, and it actually, as I was suggesting before, it changes the cultural norms, the norm, the human norms, the ethical norms of the society, and I think that's the problem we're seeing. Yeah. So your friend now yeah. may not have felt like it was legitimate to express certain yeah. views, you know, right. ten years yeah. ago, and now yeah. does. And what does that what does that say? It doesn't say whether the views are there or not. 
But that actually is a difference. I, I, you know, I understand the argument that, well, it's great that now you see how he really is, right? And, and there is something to that. But there's also something to be said for people not be, being comfortable with being hateful in public or in society yeah. and so forth. There's I didn't know he was like this. Well. I didn't know he was like that. I've known yeah. him for 55 years, and I didn't know it until President Obama got into office. I got little hints, and then this social media stuff, yeah. and, it, and he, but he is also isolated himself mm -hmm. in many ways, too, and this is his mm -hmm. form of expression now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Oh, we'll, we'll give you the last word. <laughs> the, first word the first shall be last. Yes. Oh, I was just, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, since we're talking about language, I just wonder if, if you think there's any significance to the fact of hate speech being involving bucketing people in different, you know, us and them, can, you know, situations, and whether some of these which are very um, ill-defined, like who's German, who's Jewish, uh, you know, who's, who's Turkish, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, because it's pretty easy to say, you know, what is the category, who's the British king, usually there's just, you know, one, uh, or who's the parliament, uh, who's the president of the United States, et cetera, so for political speech and all that, but I, I do think that this fundamental bucketing of people is, is, is kind of a, a, a symptom or an enabler of this. And, and, and I think in terms of legalities, defining specific categories uh, is going about it in kind of a very primitive way. The, the, the mere categorization, do you know what I'm saying? Could, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Comment yeah because, because one of the, one of the uh, in, in Stanton's taxonomy on genocide, one of it is categorization. Mm -hmm. You have to begin to not just categorize, but to other people. So it's not just mm -hmm. us versus them, but that those that are different than us, they are also in fear to us. Mm -hmm. So you not just categorize, you also create a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the challenge uh, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the internet is this idea that we, 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 we haven't used the Z word, uh, the X word, which is xenophobia. The idea that even if it doesn't border on this question of genocide, it starts with these kinds of notions of xenophobia. That not only are these people different, but that they should not have been here in the first place. Uh, but interestingly, um, I heard someone say, but us, uh, them is us, right? And, and, and I laughed, but then I realized the point that they were saying, that if we look at it, all of us, this idea that all of us at one point or another, belong to the other, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the categorization um, reminds me of how genocides occur, that you literally begin to create false notions of differences. You think in the Rwandan case, these people had cohabited and intermarried for 500 years. There was no way they were two distinct group of people. So to say, no, you're going to kill someone because they were a Hutu or a Tutsi, uh, very likely you could have been killing a family member because people had intermarried for centuries. And so, but this psychology of difference becomes so elevated that one has to make the other person not just uh, different from you, but inferior to you. And I think that's it. That's the danger of categorization. And, and in this context, it's, it's merely a linguistic... Yes, it is, it is actually it's a, not a real. linguistic gymnastics, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Exactly. I mean, one of the essential characteristics of hate speech is to define people and define them very roughly mm. and, and yes. homogenizing them yes. as a monolithic entities. Yes. And you know, that's what I think is that as a precaution against this stance, then it's important to show the hybridity of people, uh, the heterogeneity of people. Then, I mean, as a tactic, as a strategy from citizen to citizen, then. Uh, it's important continuously to underline this, uh, as I say, heterogeneity, uh, mix, uh, intermix, uh, mix, maybe just for example, mm -hmm. depending on the context, again. They're much they're more complicated than the words. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So, so we should yeah. underline this uh, distinct homogeneity mm -hmm. against homogeneity. And, um, you write, again, you, yeah, I think mm -hmm. these points are really important. Um, you raise a good, uh, good point. Um, Floster, I worked with at UMass Amherst some years ago, wrote a book called um, Heterogeneity. It was actually heterogeneous interfusions. 
And he was looking at concepts of race, gender, nationality, um, um, uh, state, and uh, class. And he was making the argument that you were making in, in a very interesting way. It actually combines the two points you were making. Both the heterogeneity of every group, right? So where are the borders, all those kinds of things. But also the interfusion of groups. And one of the things that genocide attempts to do is to break the interfusion of groups, right? So Yugoslavia is probably the great example of intermixed populations where there was no way to match people to territory without killing people. There was no way to do it. Right? Even driving people out wasn't enough, right? There had to be winners and losers, I mean, all this kind of stuff, right? But these artificial, very monolithic concepts of who's what um, were imposed, and the only way to make them real was through mass violence. Um, and so I think you're, you're, you're right that those categories lead to, can lead very much to violence. Um, Ann Waters, who's a Native American, uh, contemporary Native American philosopher, writes about this in looking at genderization through um, European language, the sort of male, female, masculine, feminine dichotomy that doesn't exist in the same way in a lot of Native American languages, and argues that that model um, itself, that binary model, is what inevitably leads to hierarchy. Um, because once you have only two, you, cre you, you sort of create a tension that, that some, you know, you're going to have to see as a hierarchy, whereas if you have multiplicities, that hierarchy becomes much more complicated. And she looks at genderization in Native American groups, which is more of a continuum than a, than a binary. Um, the last thing, uh, I, uh, last two things I would say. One is Chalk and Jonasson, who are uh, pioneering genocide scholars, uh, in trying to come up with their own definition of genocide, did something really interesting back in 1990 um, to answer this problem. How do you define a group that's targeted for violence or oppression? And what they argued is you have to look at how the perpetrator defines them. Right? Jews were defined legally in different ways in different European countries during the Holocaust. So depending on where you were, would it affect whether you would be in a concentration camp or not. There was some borderline, borderline stuff. And the Nazis actually had to use laws to define who was a Jew because it wasn't clear. Right? So they set up the whole, the whole you know, hierarchy of who counts and Michelin and, and so forth. So um, I, I think Chalky Jonasson does a great service in understanding genocide. The perpetrator, you know, this, this concept constructs the victim. Um, but I'm wondering if in the case of free speech that's a problem because then it opens up the door to the, the question of well then any group, you know, white police officers are now a victim group, right? Because somebody decided white, I hate white police officers. So it, it's actually not a solution to the hate speech is issue so we have to do something. The final point I would say is, because um, we're an Armenian, you know, a lot of Armenians here, Armenians are certainly not immune from this uh, against themselves. For others but also against themselves. And I'm looking around the room at people who are familiar um, with the case of Mel, um, uh, who's the champion weightlifter, uh, who uh, transgendered uh, to, to masculine, and has suffered like violent hatred to the point of having to leave Armenia because of this. Um, and one of the fundamental, like re re recurring statements by people in Armenia is this person isn't Armenian. This is not Armenian culture, it's not Armenian values. According to who, right? And it's exactly the problem that you're saying. Somebody decided this is what Armenian is, this is what it isn't, here's the boundary, this person's outside. And it's extremely dangerous. Yeah, it's extremely dangerous. So your point is, is really important.